I hope that you'll turn with me in a Bible to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke. This is the third Gospel. And we're going to be looking at chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Luke 24, verses 13 to 35. Let's read that together. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? He asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Luke, this particular gospel writer, has a wonderful and witty sense of humor about him. And you see this showing up in different ways, both in his gospel and in the second volume of his work in Acts of the Apostles. But he is a master of using irony. Here we have Jesus, the conquering hero. He's risen from the dead. He's done something that no one else has ever done. Love's redeeming work is done. And here he is, standing right in front of them. And they don't recognize him. They're kept from recognizing him. And they proceed to explain to Jesus what has happened. Do you see the humor? The irony And I love Jesus' words here. What things are you talking about? Tell me. You tell me your version of what has happened. But inside of the irony and the humor is this astounding transformation that is brought about in these disciples. And it shows us the same astounding transformation that God can bring about in you and in me through the power of Christ's resurrection. While initially they are 
downcast, they're down, they're dejected, they're sad, they're depressed, and we're told that their hearts are slow to believe. In verse 25, the NIV doesn't translate the word heart, but it is there. Their hearts are slow to believe. But by the end, what are their hearts like? They're burning. A flame has been ignited in their hearts. And there's a zeal and a passion to announce it is true. They've got to go back to Jerusalem, this place that they thought was a place of sadness and heartache. Now they've got to go back and announce, he's risen, he's risen indeed. He appeared to us, we saw him. And we see throughout this transformation how the Lord Jesus is stoking this fire in them. He's building up this fire within them. And I want us to focus today on how it is that Jesus stokes this fire in their hearts. Because if you're not downcast today or down and dejected today, there will come a day, probably in the not too near distant future, when you will be. We're all like these two disciples from time to time. Whether or not you're a Christian... Being a Christian, being born again of the Holy Spirit does not make you immune to spiritual depression and being down, right? We all will be here at some point. And so the question is, how can the Holy Spirit bring about the same fire in you and in me that we see here so that we go away with burning hearts, hearts marked by zeal and passion? Let's look very carefully at what Jesus says to them at verse 25. As they proceed to tell Jesus all that's happened, Jesus was this great prophet. He was powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. It was acknowledged that this is a great man, clearly. And yet, the chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be crucified. And they're disappointed. It's a big letdown. They can't see that anything is different about their lives, about the world, on the other side of what happened in Jerusalem. It's now the third day, and they do recall that he told them three days later, I I will rise and you'll see me, but it's been three days, nothing's happened. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean the women went to the tomb and they didn't find him, but we're still not convinced. It's a big letdown, they're disappointed, and for many Easter will be a giant disappointment because they'll think, despite all the hoopla and celebration and Christians being so joyous, the war in Ukraine is still happening. Inflation is still rising. All the problems we had on Saturday, we still have on Monday. So what's the big deal? It seems like we have just as much reason to still be downcast and down. We had hoped that he was the difference maker. We had hoped that he was the answer, but Alas, it just doesn't seem like it, and we're not sure what good he is now. Maybe we've wasted our time listening to him and following him. And so what does Jesus say in response to all of that? How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And when we hear this, we may think, well, that's rather harsh on Jesus' part to call them fools. To have this rebuke, what do we make of this? We need to understand that in Scripture, fool means something very specific. And the various words that are used for fool or foolish, they're not communicating a lack of intelligence. Jesus is not questioning their IQ. And he's not questioning your IQ today. To be a fool, as defined by the Bible means that your heart does not have the right posture toward God. And so this is the first thing that Jesus shows us here. When we're down, we're dejected, we're downcast, we don't know where to turn, he rebukes the posture of our hearts. He rebuked the posture of their hearts. 
He says, you're not looking at things in the right way. You've got it upside down. Consider some other passages in Scripture about this. We have Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. There we read, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So to be wise has nothing to do with whether you've gone to college or not. It has nothing to do with how many degrees you hold, what your title is. It has nothing to do with how smart or witty you are. It has everything to do with your posture, the posture of your heart, the center of who you are, the seat of all your emotions and your thinking, your priorities, your values, the posture of your heart toward God. And that posture will either be one of pride or one of humility. And for the wise person, they start by fearing God, having a proper reverence and respect for God, to acknowledge God is God and we are not. But the fool, the fool says, I don't need God. I don't need God's instruction. I don't need the scriptures. I don't need this old book. I don't need the teaching of the church. I'm fine, thank you very much. Also consider Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And then turning back to the Gospel of Luke, we have the parable that Jesus tells in Luke 12 of the rich fool. This man has a great harvest. He's prosperous. He's wealthy. And he thinks to himself, what should I do with all the extra material that I've accumulated for himself? It's a season of feasting for him. He said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones because bigger barns are better than smaller barns. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. And then that very night, God says, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. This is how it will be for all those who live for what they can accumulate for themselves materially, who live for their jobs, who live for their houses, who live for their cars, who live for their income, who say, it's time to take life easy. I believe in carpe diem. Seize the day. You only live once. Use it. Get more so that you can eat, drink, and be merry. That's how the fool talks. Those who store up things for themselves but are not rich toward God. And so the answer is not to think, okay, what should I be doing with my material possessions? The answer is to look at your heart. What do you love the most? What do you prioritize the most? Who do you prioritize above all? The fool says, there is no God. I don't need God. I don't need God's teaching. Thank you very much. But the wise person says, who am I? I need God. I would be lost. I would be blinded without God. I'd be helpless. I'm desperate apart from him. And so we need to understand that we're all naturally fools. I am and you are. This isn't some other person out there that we could imagine. We're all naturally fools because this is what we all do by nature. In our hearts, we all think we don't need God. And the predominant value in your heart and in my heart, naturally, apart from God's intervention, is pride. Pride. And the result of this is what we read in Romans 1. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, 
nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts, their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. The Apostle Paul is diagnosing your predicament and my predicament. We think we're wise. But God says, you're not. He says, I'm not. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But when we reject God, when we think we can do better than God, when we think we can improve on God or improve on what God has said or what he's revealed, then the natural outworking of God's judgment upon that pride is the darkening of our hearts, the blindness of our hearts. And this is fundamentally why God keeps them from recognizing Jesus on their walk to Emmaus. They're prideful. They think they know about Jesus. They understand Easter. And they've written off Jesus. And this is how so many people think today. We have this upside-down way of thinking where we think we get to sit in judgment on God. We think that God has to prove something to us. God, if you'll just make this clear to me, if you'll just answer this question, if you'll just do this one thing for me, if you'll just answer this prayer, then I'm all yours. Who do you think you are? Who do we think we are? God doesn't owe us anything. And to think that he does, to think that God owes you something, that you deserve something from him, that's pride talking. That's foolish talk. May God rid us of that. And that's the first thing Jesus wants to clarify for them. The posture of your hearts is all wrong. First, humble yourselves before God. Don't think you have it all figured out. Put yourself under God. Let him instruct you. Let him teach you. Let him set the agenda. But for so many of us, we don't recognize Jesus. We don't recognize God. And there's this icy coldness. There's this lethargy, this slowness about us naturally. And I can illustrate this very clearly. You think of how one minute you're having a conversation with someone. I have no problem coming up with words to say in this conversation. The words just flow. But the very next minute, you turn to God in prayer. You go off by yourself. Mm, uh, I, I don't, and you can't think of anything to say. You ever experienced that, felt that? Now, you clearly had no problem talking to another person, but when you turn to God, there are no words. You're at a loss. It's because your heart needs to be defrosted, in effect. This coldness, this hardness needs to be melted away. A flame needs to be ignited. Your passion for Jesus, your passion for God needs to be stoked, enlivened, awakened. This doesn't come naturally. You see it on Sunday morning when sometimes we think, you know, I don't know if I really want to wake up and go to church this morning. Now, you didn't feel that way on Saturday, but all of a sudden on Sunday, you don't really want to go. I've felt this. I'm a pastor. I have felt this. No judgment. I, I have felt this. I'm just pointing out there is this coldness about it. Or, or you're reading one book, and you're all into it. You're interested, and then you pick up the Bible, and oh, what am I supposed to do with this? Do you see the coldness? It's in you. It's in me. And we need the Holy Spirit of God to burn it off, to burn it off to bring an awakening in our hearts, to give us a sensitivity to the things of God. But how does Jesus do this? Now, you may have thought, as many have thought, well, if, if I were these people, if I encountered the risen Jesus, well, of course I would believe. And we might expect Jesus here to say, hey, guys, it's me. <laughs> Wouldn't that be convincing? Hey, look at my hands. Look at my feet. It's me. Remember? You would think that would be the way he opens their eyes to recognize him. But that's not what he does. That's not what he does. He doesn't even say, it's me. What does he do? He rebukes the posture of their hearts. 
And then he points them to the scriptures. And in pointing them to the scriptures, he's expanded the understanding of their hearts. And this is what we need him to do for us as well. We need him to expand the understanding of our hearts. And the gate to the heart is the mind. He says you need to think. Think through this. You have all the facts of Easter. You know he was a great prophet. He was crucified. The tomb is empty. You've heard all that. Many of you have heard all that. But you're not putting it all together. You're not thinking about this. And this is so vitally important. Because if he just shown himself to them and said, hey, it's me. Well, that would have given them a great experience, right? But what about when he's not there anymore? What about when they can't cultivate that feeling they felt when he was with them? Well, it'll be gone. But what he gives them and what he's giving to us now is something far better than any feeling, far deeper than any experience. He's showing us how to think when we're down, when we're downcast. This is how the Holy Spirit stokes the flames in your heart. This is how he defrosts the coldness and the callousness of your heart and mine. We think, and it's in thinking that our hearts are changed. He wants to change the way you think. And by and large, if you look at someone's life and there's misbehavior, there's sinfulness, there's something wrong, you can't change the behavior until you change the way that person thinks. And you can't change your life or your behavior until you change the way you think. And we need Jesus to show us how to think, to expand the understanding of our hearts, to teach us how to comprehend this. And so he points them back to the prophets, to the Old Testament. Now we might wonder, okay, what verses, what, we want to see chapter and verse, where exactly is he going to point them to the necessity that the Messiah should suffer? The reason the Messiah came was not to be a conquering hero, it was to die on the cross for the sins of his people and to be raised to new life for their justification, their right standing before God. Now, he doesn't give chapter and verse, but I think that's vitally important. Because seeing Jesus in the Old Testament is not like finding Waldo. It's not like, oh, here's this passage. There he is. Oh, there's Jesus. No, no. While there are very clear predictions and prophecies concerning him, we could go to Psalm 22 My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We could go to Isaiah 53. By his wounds we are healed. There are plenty of places we could go. But what Jesus is showing them is that the overarching narrative of Scripture points to him. He is at the center. And you cannot understand Scripture without him. It's all about him. It's all a testimony to him. And there are many ways of of highlighting this, but let me show how Jesus fulfills the three primary offices described in the Old Testament. Prophet, priest, and king. Prophet, the one who speaks for God, who speaks the truth on behalf of God. Well, Jesus is certainly a great prophet, but all the other prophets are pointing to something beyond themselves, and they all died. And so the Old Testament and the office of prophet is reaching for someone who not only proclaims God's truth, but proclaims God himself. Jesus says, look at me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's also the priest that the Old Testament is looking forward to. Every other priest, they have sin in their lives. What can they offer on behalf of the people to God to atone for their sins? Nothing. They're just as sinful as the people. But in Christ, we have a priest who never sinned, who lived a perfect, righteous, holy life. And he offers his innocent, righteous life in place of sinners like you and me. He absorbs in his person, in his body, the judgment that you deserve and that I deserve. The outpouring of God's wrath upon your sins. He says, take me. Spare her. Take me. 
Father, when you look at him, not his unrighteousness, but my righteousness in place of him. Our priest, and he's our king. You have these promises that God's going to send a king, and he's going to be like David, and yet he's going to be greater than David. But David dies, and all of his sons are even worse kings than he was. And so the whole Old Testament is crying out, when is there going to be a king who will finally do what God has promised? When will God's promises find their yes? And we have Jesus. Jesus entering the scene as the greatest king. As the king who leads a holy life. And who defeats your greatest enemy. And my greatest enemy. And it has nothing to do with the Philistines or the Romans or the Russians, or any other enemy we may face. It has to do with sin inside of you. And the just consequence of that sin, which is death. Jesus, our King, our Messiah, the Anointed One, He came to deal with that. And when you understand that, you understand this is no letdown. We thought He was the one who was going to redeem Israel. He has redeemed Israel by dying in place of Israel. He's already done that. And so right now, this is why this matters. This is why this matters. When Easter Day is over, and the humdrum, the grind of daily living returns, what are you going to fall back on? When the music stops, when the pageantry is over, when the pastel colors are put away, When the flowers wilt and die, what are you going to fall back on? If you're leaning on an experience, if the music has to be a certain way for you to achieve a certain feeling, if there there have to be a certain number of people in the crowd for you to attain that experience, if all the atmosphere needs to be just so-so for you to know the risen Christ, to trust in the risen Christ, to have the flame in your heart stoked, well, you are going to be a very shallow, disappointed Christian, if you're even a Christian at all. But if you receive what Jesus gives here, if you know how to think, if you know what Easter means, if you know what Jesus came to do for you, and you can tell anyone, you can tell your family over Easter dinner, you can tell your coworkers this week, You can tell a random person in the grocery store. Well, then that's going to last. And that's how Jesus stirs them and stokes this passion in their hearts. You see this in verse 32. They ask, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Yes, it's when they're breaking bread, when they're sharing in what we would call the Lord's Supper, they're having communion, that their eyes are opened. But even when they're just reading the scriptures and and the Lord Jesus is opening their minds and expanding the understanding of their hearts, that's when their hearts are burning. Nothing flashy. Just opening the scriptures. And this is what true Christian preaching should be. I'm not here to work you up. I'm not here to move you in any particular direction. My primary job is to open up God's word. To explain it. To expound it. To exclaim God's word. To herald it. And this is the means that God has chosen for awakening his people. Stoking their hearts. Igniting that flame. Burning off the iciness. The lethargy. The coldness. Is he doing that in anyone's heart today? Did you hear who Jesus is Are are, are your affections for Jesus, your love for Jesus, are are, are these things being stirred, awakened at all? Because after saying how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken, he raised the temperature of their hearts. He raised the temperature of their hearts. He ignites this fire. Again, through the word through the scriptures opened up. Underline the word all in verse 25. How slow to believe all that the prophets 
have spoken. So many of us continue to have cold hearts. Our temperature continues to be low in our hearts because we don't read all of Scripture. We pick and choose. We like certain parts. We like a certain version of Jesus, and we read those parts. We, we pick and choose. We like to feel uplifted and encouraged, and so we read those parts. But for Jesus to stoke this fire in your heart, you need to read all of what the prophets have written. Remember, it's our pride that says, I don't really like that part. I don't think I want to believe that part. I don't think I want to read that part. I think I'll just skip over that. That's your pride. Or to think, I don't, I, I've heard all that before. I grew up in church. I've heard the Bible my whole life. I don't think I need to really spend any time really engaging in the scriptures. That's your coldness. That's icy pride making your heart harder and harder and it's desperately sick. We need Jesus to raise the temperature. Especially when we're down, we're downcast like them. We need to experience what we read of the great evangelist John Wesley in his so-called Alder's Gate experience. This is John Wesley, the brother of Charles Wesley, who wrote so many hymns we sing in church. John Wesley was a priest in the Church of England. He'd been preaching the gospel for years. Okay, he knew about Easter. He knew the scriptures. He'd memorized huge chunks of the scriptures. He knew his doctrine. He knew what he needed to know to preach the gospel. And yet, his heart had grown cold. He was downcast. He was down. And he had this remarkable experience. This is the man God used powerfully to bring about a great awakening in the UK and in North America as well. Here's what he tells us in his journal. He says, in the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street. So he didn't want to go. He didn't want to go to church. He goes to this small group Bible study. It's the last thing he wants to be doing. His heart is cold. What are they going to do? There's not even going to be any music. Why would I want to go at all? But he went. Where one was reading Martin Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that, I think, well, snooze fest. Who wants to show up and listen to someone read anything but to read Martin Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans? And yet, this is what God used. Listen to this. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did not trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. That's what God used. It's not so much Martin Luther's preface to the Romans. It's this doctrine, this teaching that God saves on the basis of faith in Christ and in Christ alone. And that's a doctrine that you can speak to yourself and remind yourself of in feast and famine. When you're in a crowd and it's glorious or when you're all alone in your closet in tears. We are justified by faith in Christ and in Christ alone. That's what God uses to stoke this fire, to stoke our passion. Are there any burning hearts out there today? Is there anyone who's moved by this? Is there anyone who can feel the temperature of your heart rising? Not because of anything in me, not because of anything else in the service, but because of God's word, because he's using that ordinary means to awaken you, to enliven you, to stir you, to lead you to go back to Jerusalem and say, it's true. It's true. He's risen. 
here's the takeaway I want to leave you with. I want to put it in the negative first. This summarizes so much of what, what I've been saying here. To stoke the joy of Easter in your heart, don't chase an extraordinary feeling, which is exactly what we often do. We need an event. We need something that's going to draw a lot of people. We need to be around a lot of people. We need the music to be so-so. We need to use certain instruments. we got to create a certain atmosphere. You're just chasing an experience. You're looking for something extraordinary. And what Jesus gives here is the most ordinary of means. He gives us the same things. You will not encounter the risen Christ in this life until he returns. That's not even available to you. So what he's giving to these disciples, what he's given to you now, is this ordinary way to encounter him, to know him, to be changed by him. It's available to you now. Don't chase a feeling. Don't chase an experience that is shallow, that will let you down. It may be here today, but it won't be there tomorrow. Don't trust in that. Instead, to put it positively, continually receive, continually receive the ordinary means Christ entrusted to his church. The ordinary means Christ entrusted to his church. And what are they? The scriptures. The ordinances. The Lord's Supper. Baptism. And prayer. And whether you're a Christian in this nation where we can worship freely or a Christian across the globe when you're, when you're under persecution, these means are available to you. Read the word. You got any water? Baptize those who come to faith in Christ. You got some bread? Some wine? Pray. Ordinary means to encounter an extraordinary Savior. Are you availing yourself of these things? This is what God uses to stoke a fire. Don't keep looking. It's right here. Just read. Just pray. Receive what he gives. And I pray that he would stoke a fire in your heart and in this church so that every single one of us is compelled to go back and to proclaim, it's true. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I know it because he's changed my heart. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we confess our superficiality. We confess the coldness of our hearts. We confess that we so often are chasing something extraordinary. We're trying to manufacture a powerful event. We're waiting for an epiphany. We think that if we could have just been there to see there isn't Jesus, oh, then we would believe. But Father, I thank you that in your infinite wisdom, by your grace, you have left us the same means that you used to open the eyes of these two disciples on the way to Emmaus, to turn them around, to do a 180 work, 180 degrees turn around in their life. Lord, may you do the same thing for us. Turn us away, Lord, from our pride, from our selfishness, from any coldness or lethargy we have in our hearts. Stoke a fire. Build it up, Lord, using the means that you have chosen through the proclamation of your word, through prayer, and through your ordinances. Lord, we, we thank you so much for these gifts that you've given to your church. Lord, may our hearts burn today. May we announce from the rooftops that Christ is risen today. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.